Tonight, a special edition of Brian Ross Investigates. The behind the scenes stories of some of America's best investigative journalists. The reporter who exposed special treatment for a politically connected billionaire alleged to have sexually abused dozens of teenage girls. They were made to believe that they were prostitutes. The reporters who exposed children dying in a special heart surgery unit in far greater numbers than any other hospital in the state. In many ways, these were families who didn't have a voice. And the reporters across the country who exposed public officials behaving badly. The sheriff in Alabama keeping government money that was supposed to buy food for his jail's inmates. He's probably the only person who watched Shawshank Redemption and was inspired by the warden. That's who he seems like. The mayor of Baltimore getting big bucks for a children's book with embarrassing misspellings. And a shout out for the high school journalists who put aside their grief to report on their classmates killed by a student gunman. These budding journalists remind us of the media's unwavering commitment to bearing witness, even in the most wrenching of circumstances. From the Law and Crime Network studios in New York City's Herald Square, this is a special edition of Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and welcome. Tonight we feature the work of some amazing journalists from across the country who often don't get the kind of recognition they deserve. They face challenges that make their work all that much more impressive. And we begin with a shout out to the Miami Herald for its explosive investigation into the special treatment for a convicted billionaire sex offender implicated in the abuse of dozens of underage girls. Today, a shout out to the Miami Herald for its explosive investigation into how this billionaire convicted sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein, was able to get what was essentially a slap on the wrist for abusing dozens of underage girls. We didn't really know how many there were. Um, but I mean, part of the story is how much was kept secret um, in, in the court documents. Reporter Julie Brown spent more than a year tracking down the young women who were Epstein's victims. I probably spoke with about eight, and of those eight, only four wanted to go on the, were, you know, courageous enough to go on the record. In a powerful video Brown produced with her partner, Emily Michaud. We were underage. We were little girls. I was 16. I was 16. I started going to him when I was like 14, 15. 14 turning 15. If you think at 14, $200, that's a lot of money at 14 years old. I mean, that's a lot of money now. And then Brown spent countless hours doing journalism the old fashioned, tried and true way to learn about the lenient deal federal prosecutors cut with Epstein requiring him to serve only 13 months in a county jail. These are 10 to 12 years worth of documents. There was probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of documents to wade through. But the turning point came, Brown says, when two key police officials trusted her enough to lay out what really happened behind the scenes. It started out, you know, give a man a back rub, but many cases it turned into something uh, far worse than that, uh, elevated to a crime. A serious crime. And what he ended up pleading to was a joke. The sentence he served was even a bigger joke. And then his probation was a slap in everybody's face. I think once the police chief was willing to go on the record with me and the uh, lead detective, both of them had never given interviews before. And I think after we did their interviews, we really realized how, how good of a story we had. And it went to uh, the heart of how much influence Epstein had um, and how he and his, uh, the people that work for him, bullied everyone associated with this case. And look, who knows what else is going to come out. I mean, the, the excellent journalism is now, has now, has spread the message. It's not just a state court case that's stuck in Palm Beach County now. People are really aware of what's going on. Brown's reporting raised questions about the federal prosecutor at the time, Alex Acosta who is now the Secretary of Labor in the Trump administration. He seemed to go to great lengths to cut a lenient deal with Epstein and keep the whole process secret, according to Brown. Acosta defended the deal during his Senate confirmation hearings. It's that Mr. Epstein should plead guilty to two years, register as a sex offender, and concede liability so the victims could get restitution. And if that were done, the federal interest would be satisfied and we would defer to the state. Brown got no comment from Epstein, nor did we. But one of his lawyers, Alan Dershowitz, told me he was proud of the deal he made for his client. 
So no regrets then in arranging a deal in which he spent only 13 months behind bars? I wish I could have gotten him a deal where he spent only 10 months. I mean, the job of a criminal defense lawyer is to get the best possible deal. Uh, if I had been able to get him a deal where he spent no time in prison, that would have been even better. Members of Congress have now asked for a full investigation of the deal in the wake of Julie Brown's reporting, and she is continuing on the story, knowing that her efforts made a difference and gave Epstein's young victims a sense of justice that the Department of Justice did not. They were made to believe that they were prostitutes. So um, they finally said someone's finally understanding that we weren't prostitutes, we were girls. Um, he violated us. Maybe now something will change. I think they're still hoping um, for, for a sense of justice that something will be done in the case. So a shout out to Julie Brown. And since her initial report, Congress has launched its own investigation. And the federal judge handling the case issued a ruling saying the federal prosecutors involved acted illegally in cutting the deal for Epstein. Next, another story that had a huge impact from an investigative team at the Tampa Bay Times who took a tip from a hospital employee and discovered children in a special heart surgery unit dying at an alarming rate. The investigative report with its own video was aptly named Heartbroken. At least 11 children dead in one 18-month period. Many others left paralyzed or otherwise harmed. Surgeons actually left a needle inside this girl's heart and never told her parents. Everyone was telling me it's the best hospital, it's the best place you can be, you're in the best hands in Florida. And we find that there was, in fact, the needle in her chest. And after the surgery was over, when they did the count they have to do to make sure they have all of the utensils and everything, they were missing a needle. So they knew they were missing the needle, but they never said anything to us. It was that troubling story that the reporters at the Tampa Bay Times say made them certain they were on to something big. I'm Kathleen McGrory. I'm the deputy investigations editor for the Tampa Bay Times. And I'm Neil Betty. I am an investigative reporter for the Tampa Bay Times. The reporters say the initial tip came from someone who worked at the Children's Hospital, which had been taken over by the prestigious Johns Hopkins Medical Center. Its promotional videos boast of a world-class reputation. They came in and told us that she had truncus arteriosus. They told us we'd be going to Johns Hopkins, all children's. They just kept telling us that there wasn't a story here for a little while um, and that they had self-policed themselves out of uh, their problems. So there was no point in us uh, further investigating or researching what was going on. But McGrory and Biddy ignored all that and dug deeper into what happened at the hospital's Heart Institute after Hopkins had taken over. After that happened, there started to be some, some serious clinical issues in the program, and that meant that children were dying at a much higher rate, and there were far more complications than this program was used to. It had tripled to about 9 or 10 percent, um, and that was the highest rate of any program in Florida that we had seen for the past decade. And then, using social media as a starting point, the reporters began to hear from families whose children had been at the Heart Institute. It was incredibly emotional. I mean, the families were, were devastated when they found out that what happened to them didn't happen in isolation, you know, that there were other families who had experienced the same thing. No family more devastated than the Escamillas. The doctor came and he goes, you know, Miss Escamilla, you know, I just, um, something about, I really hate to tell this, but your daughter just suffered a stroke. I just remember looking at him and I just burst out crying. The reporters uncovered one heartbreaking case after another. Yeah, in many ways, these were families who didn't have a voice. Uh, and in particular, they didn't have a voice alone, you know, but when they came together, they had much more of a voice. The full Tampa Bay Times investigative report told a story that some in the hospital had tried to keep quiet. You know, it, it was only a few weeks before they made pretty 
system-wide changes to the hospital. The CEO resigned. We saw three vice presidents resign. Uh, two surgeons left the hospital, two heart surgeons. The chairman of surgery stepped down from that post, although he remains at the hospital. And the new hospital president issued a remarkable apology to the families and the employees who had tried to blow the whistle. I know personally that many of you courageously spoke out when you had concerns, but were ignored or turned away. That behavior is unacceptable and will not be tolerated going forward. And most importantly, we owe an apology to the families and patients who did not receive the high quality care that is our promise to all patients. I am deeply sorry for their tragic losses. It is devastating when a child is harmed or a life is lost. For the two reporters, the profuse hospital apology served as a confirmation that they were right to pursue the story in the first place. And they say there is still more to do. As we saw, the stories had great impact, including a new state law that increases oversight of children's heart surgery programs. So a shout out to the Tampa Bay Times. Up next on our special report, the reporters who focused a light on local officials who tried to cash in on their jobs. And I sincerely want to say that I apologize that I've done something to upset the people, the people of Baltimore. We're back now with our special report on journalists whose works we have highlighted this year, including an investigative reporter in Alabama who discovered a county sheriff was personally pocketing government money he did not spend on food for prisoners. Good morning. Sheriff Todd Entrican quickly denounced sheriff the stories Todd, as fake news, a morning. political smear. Over the past two weeks, me, my family, my office, the citizens of Vettawal County have been targets of miscellaneous fake news stories. But reporter Connor Sheets of AL.com says he was confident he got it right, standing behind his stories and a video describing nightmare conditions at the Gadsden, Alabama jail and detailing how some of the money for food ended up in the sheriff's personal bank account. But we know that he kept uh, over $2.5 million, um, but we only really have snippets based on which documents I was able to obtain. The story was picked up across the state and around the country. An Alabama sheriff was defiant today as he defended his practice of pocketing leftover money from the inmates' food budgets. He's taken in well more than $250,000 a year, the most he's required to report. Shit. Rich material for the late I'm night sorry, comedians. This guy is unbelievable. He's probably the only person who watched Shawshank Redemption and was inspired by the warden. That's who he seems like. Sheet says former prisoners and jail employees told him the sheriff was cutting food costs with food that was donated, rotten, or worse. A meat product that would come in, it was kind of gray and, and drab, and some, some, of them, one, some of them called it starfish patties. They said it looked like a starfish once it was chopped up, but essentially um, it, it was wrapped in a, in a plastic wrapping, sort of like a, you know, like a roll sausage, and then that wrapping and the box that it came in um, both said in red, bold letters, uh, not fit for human consumption. The sheriff said prisoners should not expect anything more than three square meals a day. Now let me be clear. This is a jail. This is not a bed and breakfast. Domino's does not deliver here. We don't run to McDonald's and get these prisoners and detainees Big Macs. Wow, I don't know if this guy knows how to run a prison, but he knows his fast food restaurants. <laughs> Yeah, he was, he was describing his meal plan for himself. That's what it sounded like. We're not gonna get you the crispy Baconator with the cheese. And we're not gonna get you the McFlurry with the Ariel Swirl. Or the Arby's Meat Mountain. Now that one's off menu, so you gotta ask for it, which we're not gonna do. But the biggest reveal came when Sheets reported it was all legal under an arcane state law that makes the sheriff personally responsible for feeding his prisoners. It's the law. I'm not, I haven't done anything wrong. And at the end of the day, if you make a profit, it's yours. Sheets reporting found that may be true with state money, but not necessarily with the money the federal government pays to house immigration detainees. At the state level, 
Um, the governor's already changed the policy for the state. Um, the state legislators are looking now to um, push new laws, and um, there's been investigations launched at the federal, local, and state levels. So I think um, whether or not it's legal at this time is uh, to some degree to beside the point. I feel like that just gives public officials an incentive to do their jobs badly. Like, I don't think it would be a good idea to let firefighters keep any money they save on water, you know? <laughs> For all the jokes, Connor Sheets' investigation was a serious look at an often underreported condition involving local jails. Sheets says he is far from through with his investigation, which last week was named one of the finalists for the prestigious Goldsmith Award at Harvard University. And since the reporting of Connor Sheets, the Alabama governor has signed into law a bill that would prevent sheriffs from keeping state jail food funds. Next, a shout out for the reporter in Baltimore who answered a phone call with a tip on a Sunday afternoon and began to track a scandal that has now led to the resignation of the city's mayor. The FBI searching the home and office of embattled Baltimore mayor. They came out of the house with boxes and boxes upon evidence. When the FBI raided the home of Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh, it wouldn't have been much of a surprise to the readers of the Baltimore Sun and its statehouse reporter Luke Broadwater who has a good source and a good nose for when something smells fishy. And sometimes tips pan out and sometimes they don't. You know, you chase and, but this time uh, it, it resulted in something. Uh, and frankly, um, I was personally very surprised by how, um, how strong and harsh the reaction was and how quickly things began to change. The tip involved members of the board of the University of Maryland Medical Center, giving themselves lucrative deals, but the center refused to answer any of Broadwater's questions. So that, as I uh, like to say, um, set off my spidey sense, <laughs> and I said, well, why, why don't they want to answer my questions, you know? So um, I started calling around uh, people in the nose. And soon Broadwater, with the help of other reporters, documented how the mayor, who was on the board, had received some $800,000 for a series of children's books, Healthy Holly, many of which were never distributed or even printed. And we also know that uh, thousands of the books are sitting unread in a warehouse at the school system headquarters because the school system says they never asked for the books and they think they're of not high enough quality to be used for instruction. So these books just sort of showed up on the school system's doorstep one day, uh, unasked for, unsolicited. But the books are good for lots of laughs, it seems. It is hard to believe Pew's books were bought purely on the base of literary merit. Reporters who've read them have pointed out that, for a start, she can't seem to settle on the correct spelling of the name for one of her main characters. Uh, educational children's book about eating right, she spelled <laughs> vegetable wrong. <laughs> We do know the mayor had some books in her house, in her car, um, that never got to any kids. Uh, as you saw during the FBI raid, um, they were carrying out many of the boxes of the Healthy Holly books. Before she resigned, Mayor Pugh had offered an apology to the people of Baltimore for anything unethical. And I sincerely want to say that I apologize that I've done something to upset the people, the people of Baltimore that I love, care about and work hard every day for. And then she launched into a bizarre three-minute pitch for her new line of baby clothing. Swim, jump, play, walk, run, crawl. For The Sun, it has been a story no other news outlet has come close to matching. It was one of those times when everybody in the newsroom knows there's a big story, so it's sort of an all-hands-on-deck approach. I mean, I think at different points, probably maybe 10 or more reporters have had a byline on this story. And serves as yet another example of the value of robust local reporting. I think like this shows the sun, uh, what the sun at its best and what the sun can do. We, uh, we, um, we've, we've, we have covered something that nobody knew was happening. We exposed it and there's been swift change and ramifications that would never have happened if it were not uh, for a strong local newspaper. So the FBI investigation continues in Baltimore, as does the reporting of the Baltimore Sun and Luke Broadwater. Next, a shout out for some student journalists who watched as their fellow classmates were murdered and then went to work as reporters when we return.
We close out this special edition with a shout out for all the reporters who won Pulitzer Prizes this year and for a group that did not win the Pulitzer Prize, but for whom the Pulitzer judges went out of their way to honor. Like before I announce who they are, I want to break with tradition and offer my sincere admiration for an entry that did not win, but that should give us all hope for the future of journalism in this great democracy. The entry is from the staff of the Eagle Eye student newspaper at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, which submitted the obituaries of 17 coaches and classmates who were killed during a tragic shooting in their school in February 2018. The Eagle Eye submission stated that the student reporters and editors had to, quote, put aside our grief and recognize our role as both survivors, journalists, and loved ones of the deceased, end quote. These budding journalists remind us of the media's unwavering commitment to bearing witness, even in the most wrenching of circumstances, in service to a nation whose very existence depends on a free and dedicated press. There is hope in their example, even as security threats to journalists are greater than ever. And there is hope, even if some wrongly degrade the media as the enemy of the very democracy it serves. Of course the press will endure, because as the Founding Fathers knew well, there can be no democracy without it. That is something Rebecca Smith, Wendy Winters, Rob Hyacin, Gerald Fishman, and John McNamara understood too. They understood it when they went to work last June at the Capitol Gazette in Annapolis, Maryland, and were gunned down by a madman who opened fire in their newsroom. It is what Jamal Khashoggi understood as well when he bravely wrote truth to power at the Washington Post before being murdered in October 2018 inside the Saudi consulate in Turkey. In all, 63 professional journalists worldwide were killed this year, according to Reporters Without Borders. That is a 15% increase in journalists who lost their lives for simply trying to do their jobs. In their spirit, this year's winning work reflects yet again a steely resolve in upholding the highest principles and ideals of this noble profession. At what can often seem like a dark time, there do remain places where the future of journalism seems bright. That's our program for tonight. We'll see you back here next week. Good night.